Lord Jesus, we are afraid. We are sorely afraid of life, and of, of our shadows, of everything in the world. But we're coming to you this day. Coming to you to hear your word, to, to see something that happened while you walked this earth, so that something again may happen in your kingdom this day. So Lord, today, speak. Today, give us that calm voice and give us the opportunity to give you our nothing. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. We're really scared as a people out there. Lord Jesus, we're, we're, we're terrified. We're afraid. Often. I mean, look at all that's going on in the world. We, we have war. We, we have disease. We have politics that, that aren't friendly in any way. We, we have an economy that's shaky. Church attendance doesn't seem to be all that great in this country anymore. The, the, the finances are down for most churches, and most, most of us are having difficulties in our own budgets at home. The, the national debt is huge, and the debt that we have as people is huge. How can we possibly have anything? We're afraid. In fact, we're terrified. And sometimes maybe, just maybe, the fears that we have are somewhat irrational. Sometimes maybe we're worrying about things that are far beyond our control. Louis Pasteur, who, who studied milk and you know, the pasteurization process is named after, was a germaphobe. He had this irrational fear of dirt and germs. When he would come up to you and you offered your hand to shake his hand, he refused to do it. He was afraid. President Benjamin Harrison and his wife had this newfangled invention put in the White House and they were terrified of it. It was light switches. They were so terrified of it that the truth, this is true, they would not touch the light switches for fear of being electrocuted. And so at night, if none of the servants were around to turn off the lights, they went to bed with the lights on. They were terrified. They were scared. Sometimes, you know, Jesus calms the storm. Sometimes, Jesus lets the storm rage while he calms his children. Jesus had every reason today in the scriptures as we encounter him. He had every reason to be afraid, to be terrified about what was going on, to be scared, to be fearful. I mean, John the baptizer had just been beheaded. That's what occurs right before this verse. Jesus, you know, was his cousin. So there's a family connection there. But Jesus also was doing the kind of ministry that John had been doing. The crowds were starting to get larger and larger. It's unmanageable and overwhelmingly so. Jesus couldn't even find a place to go off by himself and pray. Even though he crossed the lake, he still couldn't find a place to pray. Things were getting out of control, out of his hands. The Roman army in Rome was starting to take notion of this backwoods preacher, the great oppressor, was starting to see Jesus and hear him talk about miracles in this kingdom of God that they didn't want to exist. Jesus had every reason here to be terrified, to be afraid, and yet Jesus is calm. He's calm. In the midst of all of this, Jesus gives no indication of being frantic or being fearful. There is a peace and fullness about him in the midst of all anxiety that surrounds him. And there was a lot. I mean, look at his disciples that were following him. They were highly aware and keenly understanding this fear that they had. They knew that times and places were getting bad. I mean, they come to Jesus and say, Jesus, this is a deserted place. There is nothing here. Why on earth, God, would you lead us here? There's nothing here. And yet you brought us here, Jesus. And, and not only that, Jesus, but it's getting pretty late. We're tired. And we're hungry. And not only that, Jesus, just look at the crowds. They're tired. They're hungry. Can't you send these people away? Can't we just worry about ourselves right now? Just send them away. I mean, we don't need this right now, Jesus. Can't you hear their word? They're concerned. They know what's going on. And yet maybe their fears are irrational. 
We seem to know that times are bad. We seem to know, and we seem to be saying the same things. The church is becoming a deserted place. I mean, just look at this side of the congregation, for example. What'd you all do wrong? There's nobody sitting up here. I got people in the front pew on this side. I mean, that's, that's impressive saying that I'm right here even. I, I moved down. <laughs> but we have a lot of empty pews still, right? This is a deserted place. Look, look. And we're not getting any younger. Right? Somebody pointed out a gray hair in my beard this morning. That was kind of... We're not getting any younger. The hour is late. And we seem to be sending people away. Away from church. Instead of bringing them in to church. Isn't that what the disciples were doing? Isn't that what they were saying? Like the disciples, we pray, God, something must be done. Lord, look at all that's happening here. You've got to do something. There's a wonderful comic that I saw on Facebook. It was called Coffee with Jesus. It's, it's a nice little thing that occasionally you'll see pop up on other people's Facebook pages. It's a conversation that a man's having with Jesus as he drinks coffee. And he says, Jesus, why on earth are you letting hunger and poverty and loneliness and disease and war exist in the world? I, I just want to ask you this. Why, why are you letting this happen? And Jesus takes a sip of coffee. And looks at us and says, I was going to ask you that same question. <laughs> Why are we allowing this to happen? Why are we allowing this to happen? War, disease, loneliness, poverty, pain, misery. God called us to be a part of the kingdom. A great not to be a part of some simple movement that we meet on Sunday mornings and hear a pep talk and warm the view and then go home feeling good about ourselves. God called us to be a part of the kingdom. And our response has typically been, well, nothing. We have nothing. And the disciple says, we don't have anything. That's a double negative. We don't have nothing. I said that. Yeah. We don't have the resources. We don't have the expertise. We don't know what to do. We're wrong. We're wrong, and the disciples were wrong. We have five loaves. We have two fish. Doesn't sound like much, does it, among 5,000? That's what God gave us. That's what God asks of us. God asks for our nothing. We have five loaves and, and two fish. We have passion and for this community. We have a passion for seeking out and loving others, which is church. We have people who will spend all day listening and caring for you in need. I've seen people do this at funerals and at wakes, at visitation time. People sit there and talk and, and listen and care in this church. We have a dance team that will bring a smile to your face and joy in the midst of worship. If they don't, something's wrong with you. <coughs> being honest. We, we have kids who are having fun and at the same time are seriously engaging in loving God and worshiping God and learning about God here. We have an awesome shepherding ministry that's just starting, just beginning to take off where we're trying to begin small group ministries where we can study, devote, care, do missions together, do visitation together and just be with one another in God. We have five loaves two fish. We have a community that's at our door. Over 5,000 would guarantee you in our community that need to know that they are invited to come eat with God, to come to the feast, to come celebrate the love God has for us. We have five loaves and two fish. Jesus asked the disciples, what do you have? They said, nothing. Nothing. Well, okay, Jesus, we've got these five loaves and two fish, but what is that in a crowd like this? Jesus said, bring them to me. Jesus said, give me what you have. Give me your nothing. And oh, look what happened. Look what happened when the disciples gave God their nothing. Did you see what God did with them? 
Did you see the miracle of sharing, the miracle of giving, the miracle of relationships? As people sat down on blankets together in community and ate with God. What would happen? What would happen if we gave our knuckles to God? What would happen if we spent just 10 minutes every day praying to God for revival in our community, praying to God for revival here at Iowa? What would happen? What would happen if the small groups that we had started meeting weekly for a meal and discussing life and faith and all the places that those can interconnect and be reality? What would happen? What would happen if we gave our finances deeply because of our deep passion and belief that this church can change the world for a better life? What would happen if we gave our numbers to God? Don't be afraid. God is in control. God is with us. God is for us. We don't have to be afraid. But we do have to be ready. That last part of the scripture scares me and terrifies me just a little bit. Because you know, when they gave God their nothing, when we give our nothings to God today, be ready. Because Jesus isn't just talking about doing ministry here. Jesus isn't talking about just doing ministry here and now. Jesus already has his eyes focused on the other side of the lake. Jesus is already ready to cross over to the other side of the lake. Jesus is waiting. Jesus is ready. But Jesus is waiting. Jesus is waiting for you and me to give our nothings, to serve, to give, to be ready. Give your nothing. God. And just see what the Lord does in making that something. Something kingdom. Something amazing. Amen. This morning in your bulletins, you have an opportunity to give your number. And not just finances, not just time, not just prayers, but anything you would like it to be. It says giving God or nothing. Minister opportunities at Ivan Memorial United Methodist Church. I can serve God by, and you can check all that you'd like to apply. On the back of it, you have opportunities to give your talents to the ministries and kingdoms. I want to ask that you take time. Take time to fill this out. Place it in the offering plate as a part of your offering to God. Just give it to God. Give God your nothing. Whatever five loaves you have, whatever two fish you may have, take time and pray. Thank you. This is